All right. Now today is uh, we're, we're going to be we're going to be discussing the very widely discussed case of uh, Roe versus Wade. Uh, this actually is one of the top six cases uh, in American history uh, that is the most widely discussed uh, case. The others uh, that you may have heard about are, are of course, Marbury versus Madison, the very famous 1803 case in which Chief Justice John Marshall, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, actually wrote the opinion asserting that the United States Supreme Court had the constitutional authority to review uh, ac actions taken by both the legislative branch and the executive branch of the federal government uh, to determine whether or not they were consistent with the Constitution. Uh, and that's, that's a, a, a hugely important case, obviously, for American jurisprudence. Uh, another one of the top cases, of course, is the Dred Scott case. This is the famous case that was decided by the Supreme Court back in 1847 uh, following the, the famous uh, Kansas-Nebraska Compromise in which the two states of Kansas and Nebraska were admitted to the United States uh, at the same time. Uh, and one was declared to be a state in which slavery was authorized and one of them was not authorized. And uh, a, uh, a slave escaped into the, uh, the state uh, of, uh, of Nebraska and said that they were therefore free now. And uh, the owner took an action to uh, insist that they be returned to him. And so that, that case went uh, wrong. It was decided wrongly. And uh, many people think it led basically to the American Civil War because the United States Supreme Court failed to resolve that uh, dispute adequately. Uh, a third major case that is of the same caliber of Roe versus Wade that we're going to be discussing today, that case was Schechter, a big famous case called the Schechter Poultry uh, Corporation. This is a case that was decided back in 1935 in which the United States Supreme Court struck down uh, the National Industrial Recovery Act that was the cornerstone of the Roosevelt administration. Uh, and uh, the majority of the Supreme Court by five to four ruled that the federal government did not have the authority under the Commerce Clause to regulate uh, activities that were undertaken in a state that had only minimal amounts of interstate commerce involved. Uh, and it led to the, the famous uh, effort on the part of Franklin Roosevelt, or threat at least, to pack the court. To, uh, to, uh, he, he put in the Judicial Procedures Act of 1937, he put a proposal into Congress to raise the number of justices on the Supreme Court from 9 to 12 so that he could appoint three new justices and overcome the five to four opinions that have been handed down uh, three of them actually by the Supreme Court to stop his uh, effective attempts to deal with the Depression. Then, of course, uh, a fourth one is uh, Brown versus the Board, which many of you have heard, uh, heard a lot about. It was the 1954 United States Supreme Court case that declared unconstitutional the racial segregation of public schools in the United States. That's the famous Brown versus the Board uh, case. And then there's the one that you guys have heard about within your lifetime, which is, uh, is uh, Bush v. Gore, in which the United States Supreme Court decided uh, that, in fact, uh, George W. Bush uh, had won the election in the year 2000, probably a decision that most everybody regrets now. Uh, but anyway, they, they, they ruled that, and, and it really... Is, is one of the, the fundamental uh, undermining of the uh, sense of respect that people have for the Supreme Court because in that five to four opinion, the five justices that voted to instill him as president or install him as president were all the Republicans uh, voting against all of the Democrats, uh, the other four. And so the, these, these, uh, these five cases are uh, among the very most uh, discussed cases in American a judicial history, but Roe versus Wade is one of these. And uh, as for that, Corey? Uh, yeah, so the Bush v. Gore, is it, it's just significant or you're talking about in terms of citation? Most, no, no, not citation. Most discussed okay. in the media for the most part. But it's the most widely discussed in uh, these cases and therefore 
are, are cases that may be in the kind of collective consciousness of the American people. Uh, there, there are others that may be more widely cited because they have higher technical uh, pertinence to certain types of uh, a broader range of decisions. But these are, are among the most widely discussed cases in American history, and Roe versus Wade is one of those. And uh, I want to make clear that the, the cases, the, all the rest of the cases that we've, we're going to be discussing in this course and all the ones we've discussed so far are cases in which I've played a major role, uh, either initiating the case or, or doing the case up in the appellate system or to the Supreme Court. Uh, the reason I, I put Roe versus Wade in here is to follow up on the Eisenstadt versus Baird case that I was instrumental in that we covered on Tuesday. But I wanted to show you the impact of the Eisenstadt case because the Eisenstadt versus Baird uh, case is one of the cases that is cited uh, by virtually every one of the justices that participated in these decisions uh, in Roe versus Wade. That this is another one of those cases where you had uh, four justices uh, joined in the, uh, the plurality opinion. Uh, but but uh, of those, there, there were actually Three, three justices that joined in that plurality opinion, each of which filed their own concurring opinion. And so that when you, when you look at it from a precedential point of view, Blackman, who is most known by everyone as the one who wrote this opinion for the Supreme Court, which we'll discuss in some detail here today, uh, he was, he, there were three concurring opinions, one by Justice Berger, uh, one by Justice Douglas, and one by Potter Stewart. And so a lot of the uh, opponents of uh, the decision point out that the decision that was written by Blackman only really was actively supported in its logic by four of the justices. Uh, and that the other three justices, uh, Berger and Douglas and Stewart, all supported the outcome of the decision, but for different reasons. And so that they, the, the critics of the Roe versus Wade decision uh, weigh in by saying that that line of analysis, which we're going to discuss here some today, uh, is only supported by four justices. That's what they argue. Uh, and then, of course, there were the, uh, the dissents by Rehnquist and White uh, in that case. Uh, so that what, what I want to do today now, did you, I mentioned last week at the end of the lecture that, that it would help you a lot if you actually read this decision. But it's, it's, a, it's a big decision and it's a complex decision. And uh, can you can you just see a show of hands of how many of you actually have read the decision on the part of the court? So we've got one, two, three, four, five. Okay, six. Okay. Now that's the that uh, uh, it would help it would help you in participating in the discussion if you'd read it. But we're, we're those of us who have read it will be discussing it somewhat more vigorously, I think. Uh, but I, want you to, I don't want you to feel that you, you shouldn't participate in the discussion uh, because it wasn't officially assigned. So don't, don't feel reluctant to jump right in and offer your opinion because it, it may well be specifically addressed. Whatever the question you have may be specifically addressed by one of the justices, and then we can, we can talk about that, okay? Now, this, this is a case that now, if you want to, if, if, if you were to determine to write your paper, either your midterm or your, or your final, about this particular case, uh, you might want to get a hold of this book. This is, this is the most thorough discussion of the, of the history of the case, how it came about, and uh, the, the young lawyers that, that did this case. Uh, you'll be delighted to know uh, that uh, uh, Linda, Linda Coffey, Linda Coffey and uh, Sarah Weddington were two uh, lawyers. They were 23 years old and 26 years old. Uh, it was the very first case they'd ever done. Uh, and it went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And, uh, and Sarah Weddington, Weddington argued the case in front of the Supreme Court. It was the second case she'd ever argued uh, in her history. The first one was in front of the Court of Appeals. Uh, and then this one was in front of the United States Supreme Court. And she won the case. So to give you... Uh, a sense that you know you don't have to wait forever, uh, you know, from uh, to get at these kind of cases. That you can you can take them up uh, as soon as you get into practice, or as I've demonstrated, even before uh, you get out of law school. Uh, but this is uh, the book is called Roe versus Wade by Marion M A R I A N Fau F A U X. 
uh, or foe, her name is, but, but it's a very thorough discussion of it, and you can, you can read through it, and that way you'll know more than virtually anybody else in the country about it, uh, and can then offer your opinions in your paper. Uh, but it goes through the details of the, the individual people that were all involved, kind of the drama of it, which I am able to tell you about in the cases that I was personally involved in, yeah, but I don't, want to, uh, I don't want to pretend that I have any unique personal first-hand knowledge about all of this. It's just that I've read this, and so I know a lot about it. But the, the bottom line is, is that up until, uh, start, well, starting about 1900, uh, right around the time when there was a, a beginning of a major surge on the part of the women's suffrage movement that went on all the way to, to 1919, when women's suffrage actually became an amendment to the United States Constitution, there, were, there was a, a, a huge push on the part of the women's liberation movement, the earliest uh, manifestations of it, to deal with this issue of birth control. There was a very strong position taken by the, the, by the women's movement that the uh, inability of women to control their own uh, births of their children and decide when and if they wanted to have children, that in fact it was a major source of disempowering women. It interfered with women's uh, professional choices, their educational choices, uh, and that their whole life ended up being dominated by this decision of whether to have children or not. And of course, it feeds back onto the issue of Eisenstadt versus Baird, because without some effective means of birth control, uh, the, only, the only options that women had was to refrain from any type of sexual activity at all, uh, or else they ran this risk of becoming pregnant and uh, having no options but to face criminal sanctions if they tried to get an abortion. So that you can see that Eisenstadt v. Baird dealing with the birth control issue uh, and this issue of Roe versus Wade are very intimately connected. Uh, and it was, it was recognized as such by the justices in the case. And, and uh, all of the justices except for Rehnquist and White in dissent uh, recognized that the, that the case of, of uh, Eisenstadt versus Baird uh, had to be viewed as having seminal importance to their decision in this case. Because they said, they said that if in fact we're going to recognize, as we did in the immediate past term of the Supreme Court, in the immediate previous year, they had ruled that people have a, an absolute constitutional right to exercise birth control and to use contraceptives, whether they're married or unmarried. And so what they said is that if, in fact, we've recognized this fundamental right and you just expand the right conceptually to be the right to decide whether or not you are going to become a mother or a father, for that matter, if you, if you have a right to make that decision, then it has to include the right to have an abortion. And so the question then became, uh, whether or not this was an absolute right that the state had no right whatsoever to interfere with or whether it was subject to some types of reasonable restrictions that were supported by a compelling government interest. And that, that became a, a source of debate uh, primarily between uh, Justice Douglas, who is the most progressive member of the United States Supreme Court that you're ever going to have the pleasure of reading. Uh, and uh, Rehnquist, who is probably the most reactionary uh, judge that you're ever going to have the guarded pleasure of uh, reading his opinions. Uh, there, there, is, there is one, you, you, can't, you can't touch upon Rehnquist with a, a group of people who are not yet familiar with a lot of these areas without telling the, the famous story of Rehnquist. When he came out to the Supreme Court, the first the decision that he wrote was a decision in which women had challenged uh, the uh, insurance, uh, the, the health insurance that they were given uh, on the grounds that it did not, that it did not uh, cover pregnancy. This is a sister companion case to the argument that's going on right now about whether or not your insurance has to cover the right of birth control. But in that particular case, uh, there, there was a, a government contractor that in fact had insurance for its employees, but they refused to cover pregnancy benefits. Now they would pay for men's hair transplants, 
and they would pay for men to have Viagra. Uh, they would pay for, for men's uh, vasectomies. Uh, and they would also actually pay for men who injured their knee playing touch football for the company's touch football team. But they wouldn't cover uh, pregnancy. So it went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, challenging it as a violation of Title VII, the, the statutory provision of rights for women, uh, since we have not yet accomplished the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, and the, the uh, opinion that was written by Rehnquist was saying that uh, the challenge to this as violating the equal protection uh, provisions of the Constitution uh, were not applicable because, in fact, the people who did not get the pregnancy benefits uh, as distinct from the women who were pregnant, who wanted the benefits, was a class of people that included unpregnant women and unpregnant men. <laughs> and that because of that, the Equal Protection Clause couldn't be applied to it. And uh, so to give you some idea of, of the, the uh, intellectual gymnastics that Rehnquist is capable of, that was his first opinion. That, uh, that since there was a whole uh, uh, portion of this category of unpregnant men uh, in this one class, that in fact the women did not have a right under the Equal Protection Clause to have, uh, to have a right of pregnancy benefits. But anyway, he weighs in again here in the, in the uh, Roe v. Wade case. And that if, you, if you want to read uh, paradigmatic examples of a progressive uh, justice, uh, you can read Douglas's opinion, his concurring opinion in this case, and to see a reactionary judge, you can see Rehnquist's opinion, his dissent in this case. But the big famous decision of this case is the one that was written by Blackman, with which uh, four of the justices uh, agreed, including himself. And what he said in this case was that, look, we have uh, people in front of our court insisting that the right to have an abortion is an absolute fundamental right guaranteed by the Constitution to all women and it is a decision to be made only between her and her physician. He said, on the other hand, we have all of these right to life people here in front of the court filing tons of amicus briefs, which are what they call friends of the court briefs, where other groups and institutions that uh, are viewed to be of adequately sound standing can present briefs to the Supreme Court to assist them in making their decisions. And uh, so we have a whole bunch of these right to life people that say that, look, from the instant of, of fertilization and conception, uh, that the state has an absolute interest in protecting the right of life of that fertilized egg. Uh, and all the way through the various embryonic stages of gestation, the state has a, 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 an adequate interest to protect the interests of that fertilized egg and that life, and that these two rights clash. The, the right to life of that particular uh, fertilized uh, embryo and the right of women to make decisions about whether or not they choose to be a mother at this time. And so what the court did, the four justices in the, in the plurality, what they, what they said, they came up with this extraordinarily important line of analysis, which uh, it's important for you in any course that you're going to be taking that deals with constitutional cases and would by, by, almost by definition include Roe versus Wade to understand this unique quality about this. Because the fact is about 99% of the people that engage in the big argument about Roe versus Wade have never read the opinion. And, uh, and it's not surprising because people don't bother reading these opinions. They just take their information second or third hand or fourth hand and then get really uh, into a high state of dudgeon about one position or the other. But in this particular instance, what, what Justice Blackman did is he said that the, the real test here is not whether we're going to adopt one or another of these absolute positions, uh, these alternative positions, because we would have to, in that case, be able to make a decision as to when life really begins. And they said, they said that there is not an adequate consensus 
among the citizenry in the country, or even among medical experts, or philosophers, or theologians, they pointed out in their discussion, uh, as to exactly when life begins. There is an element that believes that it begins at conception. There is another uh, element that believes that life really begins at a point they call quickening, when the embryo actually starts to move around. And then there's a third test, which they said some, some of the experts adopt, which is called viability. And that is when the embryo is adequately developed, that given the medical technology that is available in our society, that embryo could be sustained ex utero. That the, if, the, if the embryo at that stage of gestation were to be uh, surgically removed from the mother, it could be sustained and brought to full uh, fruition as a, as a human being. So that there are these three different potential stages that were up for discussion. So they, they settled on a third stage, or I believe it was something along the lines of 24 months. 20, 24 to 28 weeks. And you stated that uh, medical technology, as long as it's viable outside regarding the current technology, well, what happens in the future when, uh, as soon as conception, and you could remove you know, the microscopic... You are such a smart boy, because that's, a, that's exactly the point. And uh, this is the one, when, when I was teaching in law school, uh, that, that everybody ended up coming to a kind of a flash of insight that, in fact, this, the, uh, the degree of technology that actually exists is a critical factor in, in applying Roe versus Wade. And so that, that uh, as I've advocated when I was chief counsel for the United States Jesuit headquarters in Washington, and the Catholic Church was all jumping up and down about this, I said, look, if you're really serious about this, you know, rather than trying to criminalize uh, the, the doctors and the women uh, that are involved in these decisions, what you ought to do is put your energy into trying to develop technology. You know, and uh, now, now that wasn't a very heavy, because I also happened to be the only man that was uh, working with the National Organization for Women on the Equal Rights Amendment. And uh, so I know Ellie and uh, the people at it now, uh, and Sarah uh, was, the, uh, was the National Labor uh, Secretary for the National Organization for Women, so we were very closely related to a lot of those people. They, they don't want to hear about that. They don't want to hear about uh, tipping off the Catholic Church or all the right to lifers, that what they ought to do is they ought to pool their funds and come up with some kind of technology by means of which a, a fertilized egg in the earliest possible stages could in fact be removed through a procedure which is no more intrusive or no more uh, painful uh, to a woman than would be a whatever the the uh, abortive procedure would be at the time. Now, uh, of course, there is there is activity on the the side of the National Organization for Women where they're coming up with technology such as the morning after pill, uh, and others. That they're they're smart, and what they've done is they've figured out how to get in on the technology at the front end as to how you terminate a pregnancy like that uh, as early as possible so that you wouldn't have to get into a stage of, of more complex surgery involving doctors and, and lawyers and all of that. So, so the, it, it raises that question that once we get to that point uh, where there is a technology that is available, uh, the question then really shifts to a very interesting perspective. What if, in fact, a, a woman became pregnant uh, with an unwanted pregnancy uh, and, in fact, wanted to undertake an action to terminate that pregnancy and, and end the gestation of that uh, fertilized uh, uh, egg at that stage, but there was technology available, which all they had to do was go in and, and, uh, and go through some kind of a procedure that was just a very minor uh, procedure uh, that, that didn't involve complex uh, medical dangers or anything like that. Would the woman have a right to insist that she has a constitutional right not to have that child or that embryo brought to full fruition. 
because they would argue that, look, I don't want to have a child running around in the world somewhere that I don't know about or that I have no contact with or relationship with or that you know, sometime 18 years from now is going to show up on my doorstep and say, hello, mother, here I am. Uh, you know, is there a right that women have to be free of that type of uh, obligation, a kind of a moral, ethical, or metaphysical, or, or psychological obligation? And, and that's one that my own personal opinion is that the National Organization for Women and the, uh, the Now Legal Defense Fund and the uh, other organizations should be addressing uh, themselves to. Uh, at this stage to try to get out ahead of this issue before they're confronted with it. Now, fortunately, the people on the side of the right to life things are, are attacking this whole thing, you know, with hammers and tongs and are, are kind of just, you know, throwing themselves against the walls of the Supreme Court and insisting upon attacking this very analysis itself. And, and so they're, they're engaged in processes of trying to get pieces of legislation passed in various states declaring a fertilized egg to be a person. Now, in, in, if you look at these opinions, even the opinion of Justice Blackmun, you can see where there's some room for them to make this argument because what the, what the case says, what the four-judge plurality says, is there comes a point in time when, given the present technology, the, the fertilized uh, egg, which is now an embryo, uh, is in fact viable. Uh, somewhere uh, between 24 and 28 weeks, and that it can be sustained ex utero by the technology that we have. And so what he says, what they say, is that clearly at that point, the state, capital S state, uh, whether it's federal or, or state, that has a, an adequately compelling interest to move in to protect potential life. And that's the term that they used. And it's, a, it's, it's a, a, a peculiar term to use because for them to assert that life is potential only at the point of viability as, they, as distinct from quickening or as distinct from the point of conception is not, is not in my opinion, conceptually defensible because it's, it's all potential life. And that's the argument that they make even further as to why they are opposed to birth control because they say birth control is just an extension of stopping potential life. And that what they assert is that the, the act of sexual intercourse between a man and a woman is in fact, by definition, a, a potential procreative act. Uh, otherwise, it is being undertaken for purposes that are not appropriate. That it is either for uh, entertainment, or uh, personal satisfaction, uh, sort of like eating too much haagen ice cream. You know, that, that's the, they get into this particular kind of argument about this. Uh, and the, 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 the fact is, is that, uh, that from, a conceptual, from a conceptual point of view, they feel completely authorized to be making that kind of an argument. Because to undertake uh, an intentional choice of stopping what would otherwise be a perfectly natural consequence of your activity would be the fertilization of, a, of, a, of an egg cell and then the natural gestation process of giving rise to a, a, a new life that any conscious effort taken to interrupt that natural process is in fact defying what they consider to be the natural order of things. Now, so, so that, that, you, that one has to be prepared to deal with that type of an argument uh, because they're, they're going at it tooth and tong to get these statutes passed in the states now, declaring a fertilized uh, egg to be a person, uh, uh, taking positions that insurance companies you know, cannot be authorized to finance uh, or, or provide the service in their insurance policies for paying for abortions. They're, they're coming at this with every, every uh, effort that they can because they are engaged from their perspective in an entirely righteous undertaking. Okay? And so that, so that people who, who 
are in favor of a decision in Roe versus Wade and protecting the right of women to decide when and if they decide to be a mother or not need to understand the, the details of this case and the different reasoning that was undertaken in, in this case in order to protect that right from its ongoing kind of onslaught uh, right now. And so that, uh, that's why I want, to, I want to direct your attention to these, uh, these issues because, because uh, for example, Justice Douglas, he goes beyond Blackman's position. Blackman says, we don't want to make a decision as to when life really starts. Uh, but he, in effect, says that while not deciding when it starts from a metaphysical or spiritual or theological uh, perspective, he approaches it very importantly from this perspective that I've talked about before, from the perspective of what type of power or authority does the state have? And what, what you see has happened here is the, the liberals and progressives on the Supreme Court have imported through the 14th Amendment the same fundamental concept that underlay the creation of the United States federal government. They took the position that the federal government does not exist in, in nature. It's a complete creation on the part of the people coming together as a collective and making a conscious decision to create a government of limited power for purposes of serving the people. And the only powers that that government has are those that are specifically delegated to it. And therefore, the people do not have any obligation to specify what the specific fundamental rights are that we have. We only have to look to the question of what specific powers the government has been expressly authorized to exercise on the part of the covenant that creates it. And in that case, of course, it was the Constitution of the United States. So, but what happened is that the, the liberals and the progressives on the court, with the passage of the 14th Amendment, what they did is they superimposed that same set of assumptions on the state governments. And there had never been any real strong discussion uh, of that concept with regard to the state governments. That the state governments had been organized when they were colonies, and uh, they, some had charters, some didn't have charters, some had constitutions, some didn't have constitutions. They just, uh, what they did is they basically imported the, the European concept that, well, the collective, somehow, the collective has some kind of inherent authority to be able to protect its interests uh, over and against individuals who might be marauders or outlaws or people who might be taking advantage of individuals or the whole community as a whole. And so therefore, the collective was viewed almost as being imbued with some sort of kind of sacred or semi-sacred authority, some kind of inherent right to protect itself, which used to be exercised by the kings that were, as I mentioned last week, were actually ordained by the pope. And it was understood implicitly that they were being given authority, delegated by God, who is the ultimate and infinite creator of the entire universe, that they, in fact, had direct derivative authority from God to do presumptively whatever it is they thought was best, and that individuals were completely subservient to that kind of authority. Now, that's, that is an extraordinarily important concept for you to grasp. Uh, in a course like this, uh, in any other courses you're going to be taking relating to constitutional law, and to understand the nature of the cases that you're going to be studying, we're all going to be studying together, because I have, I have basically driven a stake into the ground at that spot and have, have tethered the courts to that, to that stake, that in fact the analysis of any one of these cases has to begin with what power has been expressly delegated to either a state or federal government to be able to do what it is they're talking about doing. And that you, you, have, to st you have to hold on to that position right from the very beginning and never let go of it. Because if you, if you don't hold on to that position, that you're going to find yourself, the court drifting over into this unconscious assumption 
that the state or the federal government has the right to do anything it happens to want to do because it somehow inherited that inherent authority that belonged to the king and to the collective that resided in the colonies. So, so it's a very important concept to understand. And in this particular case, what Blackman did, Blackman said, look, that the government, the state, in this particular case, the state of Texas and in the, in the state of uh, Georgia, the state does have a point at which it becomes authorized <coughs> to move in on and regulate and restrict this even fundamental right that we've recognized in both Griswold versus Connecticut and in Eisenstadt versus Baird, the right of a person to decide whether or not and when they want to become a parent, okay? And, and what, what they're saying basically is that if in fact, if in fact a, uh, and now what they're saying is that if a woman has in fact become pregnant and has allowed the gestation process to go to the point of reaching 24 to 28 weeks and not have done anything about that up to that point in time, that two different factors now begin to give the state the authority to exercise its police powers. One of them is to protect the health of the woman, and the second one is to protect the potentiality of life that resides in that now viable embryo. Okay? And, uh, and so what, they, what they've done is implicitly they have... They have come to the conclusion that given the fact that the state and the collective have taken it upon themselves to develop a degree of technology which is able to sustain the life of that fertilized embryo to the extent to which they've been willing to exercise that type of responsibility, that they then have become invested with a decision on the part of the collective community to take responsibility for that, for that embryo. Now, I've made a further argument to the Catholic Church, both to the, the United States Jesuit headquarters and to the uh, United States Catholic Conference of Bishops, that they would have an additional obligation to raise that child. If they, if they insist upon a woman, after the, after the embryo has developed to a 24 or 28 week period, and they're going to authorize the state to prohibit them by criminal sanction from aborting that, that uh, pregnancy, that the state and the Catholic Church has the obligation of not only raising the child, but providing the child with an education, with providing the child with the, all the benefits that, that uh, the, the best well-kept children can have. Uh, in the, until such time, and this is the argument you need to remember, until such time as they have agreed to do that, they have not, in fact, demonstrated the kind of responsibility that would carry with it the authority to intervene through the, through the exercise of police power. Okay, so, so that's the key to your argument that you want to keep in mind and, and never forget. Because it applies not only in this particular case of Roe versus Wade, one of the five or six most widely discussed cases in American history, but it applies to virtually every single case you're ever going to see. Because, the, the, because if, in fact, the collective or the state or federal government somehow has a process by means of which they can take upon themselves specific authority to intervene in the exercise of fundamental rights through some kind of authority that is not specifically designated in the Constitution, then that's a very dangerous process. And you can see that they've done it here. They have, they have at, the, at the same time, they have asserted the right of individuals to have fundamental rights recognized out of the tradition of culture that have, that have gone on for, for many years as a commonly understood right that people have, it isn't necessary pursuant to the Ninth Amendment to have articulated them in the Bill of Rights. They say that these inherent rights belong to people and have belonged to people has been commonly understood that we had these rights. We don't have any obligation to have to enumerate them because we've not delegated to the government any one of the specific authorities to interfere with them. 
Okay? And uh, we, we're happy when we see that type of kind of metaphysical and historical argument being made on behalf of our rights. But in this case of Roe versus Wade, you see the argument being basically given the same authority on the part of the state and the collective, that they can somehow, by, by some kind of means of, of engaging in a collective set of activities that express a willingness to accept responsibility for developing the technology that is able to salvage a fertilized embryo and bring it to full life, that, that our argument is that, well, you haven't done that thoroughly just by developing the technology. You know, you, you have to take on the additional responsibility of raising and educating that particular child, okay? But if they are smart and they end up getting it and they, they agree to do that, what they've done is they have, through this process, this kind of existential process, they have basically put themselves into a position where they can, for example, think of, think of the horror story. Think of the horror story where there is a, there's a, a, a woman who, for whatever the reasons are, has carried a, a, a fertilized embryo to the point of a 30-week period, and she is seeking to figure out how to terminate this pregnancy, and they have police, armed police, searching for her, you know, trying to hunt her down and put her into some kind of a place where she cannot get at medical assistance, even if the doctors are available who are willing to do it. That they will arrest her, they will arrest the doctors, you know, that they will, they will put you in prison if they catch you trying to do something like that. That is, that is a nightmare scenario. And yet, it is, it is potentially in the future. Because if, in fact, the forces of the, of the right to life, the, the Catholic Church, the, the basic fundamentalist churches, the states that are supportive of them, the right-wing reactionaries, if they get their act together and they not only develop the technology that pushes back into an earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier stage of gestation, the ability of medical technology to remove the fertilized egg and bring the, the uh, fertilized egg to full, to full term, you know, you still have the argument that they can't do that and then just slap the poor kid in an orphanage, you know, and impose that kind of trauma upon the, the child and upon the mother, okay? So you, you, you want to you wanna stake out that position to be able to make that argument, but you need to know that that argument has an end point where if they do get it together and are willing to do all of that, you're going to be confronted with the the, the uh, challenge of making an argument that somehow there is a right that is possessed by, by women not to have a child out in the world that is their child against their will if they have the ability to bring that, that pregnancy to a termination, you know, if, it's, if it's medically possible. So this is a, you can see this is a, a very complex and sophisticated problem and here you see the nine justices of the United States Supreme Court attempting to come to grips with this. And it may, it, it's, it's a very, very famous case, and it has, it has generated extreme positions uh, all across the spectrum. Yes? Is, is this argument that uh, viability <clears throat> is, is the determining factor mm -hmm. affected by the actual statistical reality the earlier you bring a, a fetus out of a pregnant woman, the more chances they have of a degraded lifestyle, of learning disabilities. Oh, yes. Disabilities. Oh, yeah, no, no, the, the, those, those arguments are all there. Those arguments are all there. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, and in fact they, they talk about the, the potential adverse impact upon women uh, psychologically and all of that by carrying a, a, an unwanted child to term and they talk about these potential repercussions on the on the embryo on the you know of this and and very very importantly they they ended up uh, there was a, an additional argument they made in there and that that was that the uh, very interesting statistic and if you if you were really sharp and you read these cases, you can come to a point in the decision by Blackman which is extraordinarily important. And what he says is that the reason that he has chosen this point between 24 and 28 weeks 
is because he was citing statistics that showed that until the gestation had developed to a point of 24 weeks, that the, the statistics showed that the health, the negative health impacts upon a woman having an abortion up to that point in time, the statistics show that it is less risky than in fact carrying the baby to term and having the child. Because, if the, because of the numbers of deaths and injuries to women that occur in childbirth actually exceed the dangers of having an abortion prior to that time. And he actually made the argument that therefore the arguments that were made on the part of the state that they were moving in not to just protect the potential life, which is one whole argument we've discussed, but to protect the health of the woman. What they've said is it's completely irrational for them to say that they're insisting upon having the, the child carried to term to, care, to protect the, the health of the women when the statistics, the statistics show that it's more likely to be damaging to them to carry the child to term and have the baby than it is to have the, to have the abortion. Okay, So that I, I just point that out because it's a, it's a second cousin to the question that you raise is what are the statistics that are being used here? And in the court resorting to citing those statistics, a very interesting point. It turns out that Blackman, I think you read it in, in part of the thing, that Blackman used to work for the, uh, I think, the Mayo Clinic uh, back when he was young. And so he went to the Mayo Clinic and helped them, had them gather all of these statistics for him. So that he put this long, he, he actually, you won't find many decisions where they actually cite the Stoics, uh, the pre-Socratic the pre philosophers, uh, but they do here. Uh, Blackman cites them in going through his history of this whole history of abortion. He cites the Stoics and what their theories were as to when life begins. He talks about the Aristotelian principles as to when life begins. He actually goes back into an historical analysis of when it was that the Catholic Church changed its position from believing that life uh, happens, the ensoulment of the, uh, of the fertilized embryo occurs at the point of quickening, and when they changed that to be to the point of conception. So he actually went right after the Catholic Church on their own ground and said, look at this decision you've made that, that life begins at conception didn't even start happening until after 1900. He said, so you've got this entire prior history where you said that life didn't really, the soul didn't come into the fertilized embryo until quickening. So he, but he did not go to the point of saying, therefore, we're going to have quickening be the point uh, at which we say life starts. We're going to say that it starts at viability because he... He didn't get into the metaphysical or theological or philosophical argument. He returned to the question of the power of the state and what the origins of the power and authority of the state, where they came from. And so that, but, he, but as I say, he, he endorsed implicitly some kind of an existential process by means of which the collective and therefore the state can engage in a process of asserting a certain type of willingness to undertake responsibility uh, as, the, as the sine qua non as to whether or not they had the constitutional power to infringe upon the otherwise unbridled exercise of a fundamental right. So, so that this is, this is the kind of stuff that law school is made out of, uh, you know, these types of extraordinarily interesting discussions which involve metaphysics, they involve history, they involve statistics, they involve uh, interpretations, narrow interpretations of precedential uh, cases, etc. It's, it's an extraordinarily exciting uh, realm to engage in. Uh, less exciting now, given the kind of uh, intensely ideological divisions on the Supreme Court. Because now, really well-schooled lawyers, all they spend their time trying to do is figure out two things. What does Justice Kennedy think about this, and how long is he going to live? You know, the, those those are the two those are the two major considerations in doing any kind of United States Supreme Court decision now, and and it's really quite troubling that they keep still referring to the minority, the four in the minority, as the liberals on the court. Not a single one of them is liberal. You know, they're not liberals. They're moderates. They're, they're kind of almost inveterate moderates. Uh, those those four justices. And that's that, that scale that I told you about before, that, you know, that, the, that the reactionaries on the right 
do have a, a more right-wing position to the, to the right of them, which is the authoritarians. And just as I said, the progressives over here do in fact have uh, liberals to their, to their right, and they have another worldview off to their left, which is the, the utopianists. So that this, is, this is the one that everyone keeps telling me to stay away from, not, not to you know, get into this long discussion of what the de defining criteria are for all of these different worldviews, but it's important for you to understand that those four justices in the minority are not liberals, and they're not progressives, and they're surely not utopianists. You know? What they are is inveterate moderates. Okay? And those, those moderates are in a struggle with the conservatives and the reactionaries that are on the court. And Rehnquist and Scalia and Roberts are full-scale reactionaries. And uh, Thomas, it's a little hard to tell what he is because he never says anything and uh, seldom ever writes any opinions. Uh, you know, I think he's still uh, cowed by the, how hard it was for him to get on the court to begin with. But the, but the bottom line is here that from a sociological point of view, which is a perfectly legitimate perspective of taking this, the sociological understanding of how the court functions and, uh, and how they translate their worldviews into concepts that are juridically appropriate, uh, that, that you're going to be hard put to find a case that's any more interesting and informative about that than Roe versus Wade. And it, uh, as I say, it's, a, it's one of the most widely discussed cases, and it is the case that is, that is under full-scale frontal assault right now. And it is, it, it is perfectly clear that there are four of the sitting justices on the Supreme Court right now who are hankering to reverse this decision. Okay? And, they, and they, when they do so, they want to be able to argue that they think that the states are empowered to make a decision that they believe that life starts at conception. And therefore, it'll be up to the states, not the federal government or the federal Supreme Court, to make decisions about that. That this is within the realm of the police powers for them to make a decision uh, governing that question. And, uh, and so that's, that's what's going on right now, that the, the right to life people are into the state legislatures trying to get these statutes passed, asserting the judgment on the part of the state that life starts at conception and that they're then going to build in, in the, and you'll, you'll notice if also in the, in the, uh, the uh, concurring opinions, the concurring opinions uh, of Berger, uh, for example, uh, he, he pointed out uh, and Rehnquist, Rehnquist, for example, even his dissent, Rehnquist takes the position, because of his belief in the kind of inherent authority of the state, derivative of kings and derivative of theological authority, uh, he, take, he takes the position that the, that the state has the power to infringe upon uh, a right as long as you don't consider it a fundamental right, but a, a, just a normal right of a citizen has a right to infringe upon them and the only test they have to meet is whether there's any rational, any rational support for undertaking that type of a restriction. Is, there, is the restriction attached in any rational way to any legitimate exercise of power on the part of the state? Whereas the opponents uh, to state power, that uh, Douglas and others, they say, we, we think that there's a certain set of fundamental rights, but du you'll see that Douglas even goes so far as to say that there are a certain set of very prosaic rights, uh, which, he, which he talks about. Uh, I'll point out, I, I happen to have written a law review on, article on this particular thing, but Douglas, Douglas talks about, he has a catalog of these rights. He actually starts going down through these. And he talks about rights that are in the penumbra of the First Amendment, rights that are in the penumbra of the Fourth Amendment. And then he actually, uh, it, 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 he says there's a third category of rights. He said, the freedom to care for one's health in person, freedom from bodily restraint or compulsion, freedom to walk, stroll freely, or to loaf around. <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of an interesting Kind of an interesting case. I, the, the, the law review article I wrote about it was a case called Shuttlesworth. And uh, it was down in Alabama, Shuttlesworth versus Alabama. There was a guy 
standing out in front of uh, a, uh, a, a seg racially segregated uh, uh, department store. And they had their lunch counter that was segregated, right? And black people couldn't be served there. And so he was hanging around out front uh, and uh, picketing the place. And so that this, this case came up and the decision came up as to, you know, what, what kind of fundamental right was he exercising? There was the argument there was a First Amendment right, a freedom of expression. But, but Douglas went so far as to say that, look, he didn't have to come up with any affirmative uh, constitutionally recognized right at all. He had this Ninth, ninth Amendment right just to hang out <laughs> if he wanted to, if all he was doing is hanging out there. Should an informed, concerned citizen take note that the current court members, I believe I'm correct in this, uh, Roberts, Thomas, Scalia, and Alito, okay. and there may be another one, are all Catholic. practicing Catholics yeah. to the point where they go and attend the Red Mass with the Washington, D.C. Cardinal and other, and the Conference of mm -hmm. Catholic Bishops, yeah. and are clearly be concerned that they are bringing religion completely irrational <coughs> the requirements of considering a, a case by judges uh, contrary to the fundamental expectation you bring up Marbury Madison just to bring up uh, Judge Marshall the expectation that logic will apply the Constitution as, as written and interpreted will apply, not anyone's religious dogma to overcome. Yeah, I hear it. But, the, the, but what, what they do is they, they set forth what they believe to be rational lines of analysis, that they may well be motivated by some unique theological perspective that they have or some particular upbringing as Catholics, et cetera. But they're obliged to set forth logical arguments. And for example, Rehnquist, in this particular decision, you know, Rehnquist's argument is a very, a very sound, uh, all of his are not, such as the one I told you about with, you know, the unpregnant men. But uh, in, in this particular case, he points out that the, the requirement for a state to show that it has a compelling government interest in restricting or exercising its normal police powers under health protections, et cetera, uh, that it does not have to meet uh, any kind of uniquely heavy burden. All they need to show is that there's a rational uh, purpose in what they're doing, trying to protect the health of women. And that's why, that's why Blackman made the argument that he did. That's not a rational argument because the statistics show that in fact, by carrying the child to term and having, giving birth, you have a higher risk of health damage than having, a, having an abortion in the first trimester. So what, he attacked him right along that line. And so that it's, it's clear that, that Rehnquist was trying to make an argument that sounded rational, but it wasn't. But as long as he was trying to make a rational argument, it's subject to rational criticism and attack, is exactly what Blackman did. So you, you don't, but on, on the other hand, uh, the, the Justice Blackman himself, when he's making this argument about the viability of the, of the fertilized embryo, uh, the fertilized egg and now an embryo, that his, his logic of coming up with this argument that the state has to be able to demonstrate that, it's, that, that there's, there's technological uh, means by which you can remove the fertilized uh, embryo and bring it to term, that's a, 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 a rational argument, but it doesn't, there's no historical evidence that that's supposed to necessarily give the authority to the state or the collective to somehow interfere in a fundamental constitutional right. There's no place where there's any such analysis that we've been able to find. It's kind of a unique thing that he did here. Uh, so that the reality is, and it brings us back to our worldview issue, is that the reality is that each of these judges at the Supreme Court level, because they're, not, they're only bound by other Supreme Court cases, and they can overrule previous Supreme Court cases when they're sitting there. They can actually revisit the same issues and overrule previous Supreme Court cases. None of the other courts can do that. The courts of appeals are bound by Supreme Court precedent. They, they can overrule their own circuit courts of appeals decisions uh, previous to that their sitting. 
and they can overrule and take a position different from other circuit courts in other parts of the country if they want to. But they cannot, in fact, directly defy a United States Supreme Court decision. See, and state courts can't do that either. But once they get up to the Supreme Court level, a, and that's why those appointments are so extraordinarily important, because once they get there, they have the authority to review the same issues that there have been clear precedent set on and simply overrule it. And when they get to a point where there, there's a, 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 an issue of first impression, where there are no binding uh, precedents, they have a, a right to engage in any kind of analysis they want if they can rationally justify it. But what, what you find that they're really doing, what they're really doing is they're making a decision rooted in their own unique worldview. And then what they're doing is they're attempting to figure out how to rationalize it. That's, that's, that's all they're doing. So they look to other precedents that have got something related to this to try to argue those precedents. Or they come up with strictly logical arguments that seem to be logical to them. And so that they say, well, if it's logical, it, it follows. And then they get down into premising the, the beginning of the logical string that they're going to set forth in some fundamental constitutional principle that they think is beyond challenge, such as the fact that the Supreme Court has a right to engage in judicial review. And so that the, the, these people, that, what you need to see is that at the Supreme Court level, where a lot of the cases that I happen to have done have ended up, is because they involve profound and fundamental premises. And so that's why they end up there. Uh, so th this, this, is one of those, this is one of those cases. And so that's why I wanted to, uh, even though I wasn't directly personally involved in this, since I was so intimately involved in the Eisenstadt case, and it's cited so, so uh, fundamentally, as the grounds for them to extend that right of people to decide when and if they want to become a parent to, to extending Eisenstadt versus Baird to the next step of saying that it would support the right to decide on an abortion. Okay, so that's, that's the, uh, the presentation I wanted to make to you on this. And uh, I, would, I would think that this, uh, this particular subject uh, given the, the high degree of controversy that surrounds the case and the impending potential challenges to the case would, uh, would generate a, a lot of thought on your part. And so I want to I uh, see how stimulated you're getting yet at the beginning here of this course to start asking really intelligent and profound questions. Okay? So on the uh, Roby way, discussed how uh, the focus had shifted from people uh, attempting to have the government declare where the government's right to intrude into their lives to now where the burden of proof is the government asking people where they derive their rights from. Well, that, 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 is, what, that is the general position of the reactionaries on the court is, is trying to put the, what we call the burden of going forward. Yeah. Who, who bears the burden of going forward? Is it the individual citizen? who is being threatened with an exercise of police power, or is the burden of going forward on the state to justify the source of their police power? And so that what you saw, you saw the, the difference here because Rehnquist basically says, wait a second, that's a very, very light burden for the state to meet. All they have to show is there's any kind of rational connection whatsoever to their exercise of police power, and they get away with it. Uh, and, and unless you can show that there is some long-standing, well-recognized, fundamental right that's being interfered with here. And he points out, you'll notice in his dissent, he says, this alleged right to have an abortion, he said, I, don't, I, don't, I not only don't see that anywhere in the Constitution, it's such, so far removed from the Fourth Amendment right to not be subject to search and seizure and an invasion of your home, but he goes on to point out, but wait a second, that particular right under the Fourth Amendment is not an absolute right, because what it says is they'll be secure in their person, place, and effect from unreasonable searches and seizures. And that, but on the issuance of a warrant by a legitimate magistrate that there exists probable cause to believe that a crime may have been committed and evidence may reside in one of those secure places of privacy, a judicial branch can in fact authorize the invasion in search of that place. And so he actually makes the argument that look, if you're arguing that this is a Fourth Amendment right, 
of privacy somewhere. It's not an absolute right that the state has the right just for any reasonable grounds that it's got to come in and look. And this, that would not be a, an unreasonable restraint of those Fourth Amendment rights. That's what he says. So, that, so that, that's, that's exactly right. This shows a confrontation between those two fundamental different positions. And what, what uh, Blackman in the plurality decision does is basically, to term a phrase, cuts the baby in half. Uh, in this particular case, does exactly that and just says, look, uh, we're going to strike a balance in here and we're going to have it be kind of, you know, sort of in the middle here somewhere. And what they say is that from this point forward, any state statute that prohibits by criminal sanction an abortion in the first trimester, in the first three months of the pregnancy, is automatically unconstitutional. And it says, however, if the statute prohibits abortions in the final trimester, in the final three months of pregnancy, it is presumably completely within their constitutional authority to do so because the health consequences are so dire and the viability of the, of the fertilized embryo is so obvious <coughs> that it's presumably constitutional. But the ones in the middle trimester... See, moderates, moderates love to have things divided into three equal parts. <laughs> they love that uh, because then they sit there being the rational person in the middle. This is the, the Democratic uh, Leadership Council. This is the new, more moderate Democratic Party. You know that, oh, we have all these extremists all around on our right and on our left, and aren't we great? <clears throat> and that's what they did here. So they just sort of plunked themselves right down in the middle of this thing. I said, therefore... If a, if a state statute attempts to criminalize an abortion in the middle trimester, it's neither presumably unconstitutional or presumably constitutional. It is, needs to be reviewed by the court to determine what the considerations are. And so that's the law. That's the law at the present time. <coughs> and this is why it's a standoff between these, the left and right positions and they've each been given something. The, the progressives have been given the, the uh, right in the first trimester to have uncontested access to, to abortion. And the, the uh, reactionary elements have been given uncontested right to prohibit abortions in the third trimester. And the people in the middle have to discuss and analyze any given statute that attempts to regulate abortions in the second trimester. And so that's, so you see laid out in front of you a classic struggle between the progressives and the reactionaries in a resolution undertaken by the kind of middle moderate uh, elements of the court, okay? And, and the problem is that the, that, that person now is that the moderates on the four, the four judges, the justices that are moderates on the Supreme Court now sit in the middle and you got, you got Justice Kennedy who's a conservative sitting in between them and the reactionaries. And so that the whole dispute goes on between, between basically the, the reactionaries and the conservatives and the moderates. And so the, 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 the conservative has now become the arbiter in this, so that you're getting a whole long series of really conservative decisions made by Justice Kennedy, uh, but they're not reactionary. But they're certainly not progressive or liberal and they're not even moderate, no matter what people say. Yes, let's just keep that. Uh, so you were saying earlier, earlier that um, the Constitution, the progressive view, is that you have rights unless, like, you explicitly, unless it's explicitly said that the state has power over you. Yes. Well, isn't that the same argument that people are using to say, like, I have the right to not have universal health insurance, et cetera? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah what, what, what they're saying, and they're probably going to win, you know. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the reactionaries are the ones that are going to support it, right. you know, because what, what they're saying is that we have an inherent right to be left alone. You know, if I'm just wandering around minding my own business, you can't have a, you know, a federal government official come and threaten to arrest me because I haven't gone out and bought life insurance. You know, here, here I am, you know, I'm 20 years old, 
You know, uh, I don't need life insurance. I don't need health insurance. You know, uh, and, and so that, that it's, it's an arbitrary and capricious exercise of police power. And so the, the administration attempts to track back into the, the Commerce Clause, which is the one that was the subject for the dispute with the Franklin Roosevelt thing and trying to pack the court. And they, they retreat back into what they think their strongest position is, is that they have a right to regulate anything that even so much as touches on commerce. Uh, and uh, even to the point they've had some decisions where commerce doesn't even cross state lines. And they say that interstate commerce gives them the authority to rule on it just because it's commercial now. You know? So it's, uh, that's exactly right. And uh, that, uh, I believe that you're going to see, you're going to see Kennedy. It's going to be very interesting. You watch what Kennedy says. Uh, Kennedy is going to say that, the, that the, there's probably going to be a narrow decision he's going to make is that the, uh, the power of the Commerce Clause does not extend to this, to this extent that they can interfere with this particular right. Not that, not that it's an absolute fundamental right, but that in fact that it's, uh, that it's not even a rational connection to anything. That's what the others are going to say. He's going to defeat them right along that same line that there's not an adequately rational connection to interstate commerce for you to be, for you to be interfering with this right to be left alone or loaf around the, the, to cite Douglas. Yes? I'm just following his question, but there's... Uh the law that you have to have the insurance to drive a car. Yes. So I'm wondering how that, because that's a, a health concern, is it not, that you wouldn't be able to afford to... No, no, no. It's, it's, no, it's because you'd kill somebody else. The, the reason that you have to have insurance uh, is because in driving around and being given the, quote, right to drive this dangerous vehicle, you're endangering other people. And if you, in fact, injure someone else, you have to have the health, the, the insurance to cover their medical costs. So it's not just them. <clears throat> the more... The more direct point that you'd be asking is like about the motorcycle helmets, however, is, you know, where, where does the state get the power to mandate that you wear a motorcycle helmet? You know, so you get your head bashed in, you know, fall off and kill yourself, you know, so what? You know, I mean, what right do they have to stop you from doing that if you like wind in your hair and bugs in your teeth? That, you know, that, that why, why can't you do that? And what they've done is they've gone to these extreme weird arguments that, you know, if you fall off and break your head, uh, you know, then, then they're, they're going to have to spend all that time picking you up and bringing you to the morgue and doing all that kind of stuff. <laughs> they're extremely uh, attenuated arguments that they're making on behalf of that. And uh, it's quite clear that they're trying to do it for your own good. And, uh, and that's risky territory for the, for the state or federal government to get into saying, I'm going to punish you for your own good. It sounds a little too uh, patronizing, a little too much like your father, right? <laughs> I'm doing this for your own good. Uh, and uh, people don't say, look, I don't, you know, thank you, but no, I don't need that. And so some states have allowed the, the, the struck down the motorcycle helmet. Well, yeah, I was going to say, what about the, on the same note? So, like, if he falls off his motorcycle, then I end up paying for it because, because I pay the taxes for the policeman who had to go and pick up all the parts of it and all that's, that kind of stuff, right? That's the argument they make. So can you, can you kind of apply that same argument to maybe, like, an example like the healthcare case where... Uh, you know, if like uh, Chelsea here doesn't doesn't pay for healthcare and then shows up to the emergency room, then I have to pay for it. You know, it's kind of the collective side. I mean, that's there may there may not be a legal standing, but there's like a logical standing. What what you're what you're going to see, what you're going to see, I think, is on the back end of this, they're going to say, look, it's not uh, the if the state if the state mandates that hospitals provide emergency care to people, even without insurance then you're going to be able to see an argument that the state itself, the state itself, may have the authority to mandate that they get health insurance, but not the federal government. That, that's, what, that's where this is going. They're, they want to basically, basically leave it up to the states to decide whether or not, since they're the ones that are going to be shouldering the costs, uh, because there are state statutes that are requiring these hospitals to basically provide emergency services to people, whether they've got the money to pay for it or not. And that what you may well see, of course, is that those states back right up out of that. Because you remember, you remember the, if you saw the Republican debate, uh, or maybe you had something better to do, like you had to do your hair or something that night. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you saw the Republican debate, you know, they, they got to the point where they, where they, asked, they asked Perry, uh, the governor of Texas, they said, look it, uh, are, are, are you suggesting that if, uh, you know, 
some person comes to the hospital and they're on death's door and they can go and get some easy care and it'll save their life, but they don't have any money that, that somehow, what are you supposed to do? Just let them lay there and die? And the whole, the whole crowd stood up and cheered in the Republican debate. Yay, absolutely, let them die. You know, I mean, social Darwinism on steroids. You know, I mean, there they are. And, and that's, that's the actual position that they're taking. And, and the point is, Ron Paul even says that. Ron Paul says, hey, you know, let him die. And he's a doctor, you know. He says, you know, so, so he says it too because it, it, it follows logically from his perspective. Oh, I mean, I watched the debate. Yes. And, like, I don't think he says let them die. He just says that, that as, as a medical doctor, he's never seen people who come in who don't have money get turned away. Yeah, but, but, but that, the, that begs the question, of course. It begs the question of whether or not they have to take them. And that's where the real issue is here, because the, the, if a state takes the position that they have to take them, then the state's got to figure out some way to get that paid for. And then they back all the way up into, well, how about making everybody have to pay into a pool for insurance, and then it becomes part of a tax. You know, and so the, the, that's, that's the argument. So that if, if the... If the if the personnel at the hospital are adequately eleomycinary, you know, that's fine if they want to do that, uh, but they can't make somebody else pay for it. You know, but then, then you track, say, well, they, how come they pay, how come they charge you six bucks for an aspirin then? Because what they're doing is they're backing up the costs. That's how they're doing it. They're, they're figuring out how to charge other people for it, and they spread the costs over all their other costs. And, uh, and then the question is whether in a capitalist system that's legitimate. And then you got Ron Paul's vote. You see? Because it's just the capitalist system will take care of all this kind of stuff. But the capitalist system is to some substantial extent, which you can see the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops have, in their uh, economic pastoral have condemned capitalism and condemned communism, both of the, because of their extreme consequences. And so they're, they're suggesting that there needs to be some kind of set of compromises about all this because in a straight capitalist system, <clears throat> they'll do exactly that. They'll let them lay there and die. Because unless, unless they can figure out some way to be able to recoup their costs, they're not going to do it, you know, unless they're just soft, you know, kind of soft capitalists <laughs> you know, or soft on capitalism, you know, that thing. Justice. Yeah. Yes. And I was in regards, none of the key goals of the American United for Life said that they wanted to ban private insurance companies from covering abortions. Yes. I was just wondering, how much does uh, private health companies have a stake on this? I'm not saying that they're not liable to pay or cover abortions. And then I guess also, you know, destroying pandemics in a way other health benefits. Yeah, so the main well, what you want to do is you want to see what Alec's position is on this. You know, the Alec is the is the uh, big uh, uh, coalition of corporations. Uh, they gather together and they come up with uh, 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 template legislation for the corporations. Uh, and and the, the the fact of the matter is that the, the this bill this is ironic because if and when this bill is struck down by by uh, by Justice Kennedy. You know, in his opinion, if he strikes down the Obama health care thing, they're taking $475 billion right out of the pockets of the insurance company. The insurance companies are getting a boon of $475 billion in tax money uh, from this particular health care bill. You know, and that, that was Obama. That's a classic Obama move. You know, he, he sat down and actually closeted with the chief lobbyist from the insurance corporations to help draft up this bill. And, you know, when I first talked to Obama about this, that I was out, I was out in uh, Iowa, and uh, I was working on the campaign for John Edwards before we all discovered about what was going on with Edwards, but that, uh, because he was the most liberal of the Democratic candidates back in 2008. And uh, I ended up getting to, to go meet with Obama, and uh, I sat down with Obama, and I said, look, uh, you know, the likelihood is either you're going to be getting the nomination and John Edwards is going to be your VP, or John's going to get the nomination, and you're going to be his VP. So why don't, why don't you guys come to some kind of common position on a couple of these issues? One of them is nuclear power, uh, because, because Obama is, a, is a, an advocate of private nuclear power. Uh, and I said, the other one is this single-payer health issue. Uh, and he said, uh, 
He said, "Look, we'll see. Well, what he says? What, what do you propose on the nuclear power thing?" I said, "Well, you know, I happen to have been the uh, chief counsel in the Karen Silkwood case, uh, as well as in the Three Mile Island litigation, and so I know perfectly well that you cannot really build a really completely safe nuclear power plant, uh, and you can't really get rid of the waste materials in any kind of safe way." And he said, well, "Okay, he said, look, I'll tell you what I'll do." He said, uh, "I'll make you a personal promise." He puts his hand on my arm. He says. I'll make you a personal promise that I will not authorize the building of one single private nuclear power plant unless I am personally convinced that it can be built safely and that the waste materials can be disposed of completely safely. And I said, well, that's neither one of those things is ever going to happen. And he looked all around and he said, well, then neither you nor I have anything to worry about, do we? That's what he said. And I said to him, oh, I said, that was very good. That was very good. I said, except that it doesn't answer the question of what percentage of the alternative energy budget you're willing to squander on attempting to build a private nuclear facility that works or dispose of the, uh, the nuclear waste materials in a safe way. So how, what percentage of it are you planning to squander? And he said, what percentage do you have in mind? And I said, I don't have any percentage in mind. He said, call me when you do. Okay? There's Barack Obama in action. You know, and the simple fact is that Barack Obama, being the senator from Illinois, had, they have 11 nuclear power plants in his state, and the people who own the private nuclear power plants are his fourth largest contributors. <laughs> okay, so so and, and, but the other issue was the single payer health system, and so I said to him, I said, you know, what about the single payer health system thing? He said, oh, we don't have enough votes for that. We won't be able to get enough votes for that. You know, and so what he was thinking is that you know we can't fight the insurance companies. The insurance companies are going to get blown out, blown out with a single payer health system, right? Because they sit in the middle of it, and like two thirds of every single health dollar spent in the country goes to the insurance companies, not to providing health services for anybody. It goes to the insurance companies, and so the insurance companies aren't going to let anything like that happen. And so what he did is he backed up and he cut a deal with insurance companies. We'll cut a deal where you get $475 billion uh, in federal tax monies to subsidize these, uh, these uh, premiums. And we'll, pass a, we'll exercise our police power under the Commerce Clause to mandate that people buy this uh, insurance from you. And that small percentage that doesn't have enough money to do it, we'll subsidize them to the tune of $475 billion. We will appropriate the money. So it's, it's a straight-up deal with the insurance companies. You know? So that's, that's where you have to tackle them. So you, you've, got to deal with, you've got to deal with this issue of the, uh, you know, the uh, 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 Citizens United, which is another one of the cases that, if you want to list the 10 cases that are being most discussed now, is Citizens United is the one where uh, the Roberts Court you know, declared that corporations were people. And uh, therefore, they had a right to uh, give as much as they wanted to give in campaigns. And they could lobby and pay as much money as they wanted to to lobby and do anything they wanted. Because it's a First Amendment right, a freedom of expression, like all people have as an inherent right. You know, there's a, there's a whiz-banger for you. Uh, you know? And then you say to the Democratic Party, well, look, at, why don't you just mobilize and pass a statute you know, setting that aside? And the answer is, well, what about all, all, all of our contributions from the corporations? Yeah. You know, who's going, to give, who's going to replace the contributions that we get from all the corporations? So we're certainly not going to take them on. And that's why you have a Republican and Democratic Party that are basically in lockstep, you know, against having a, 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 a single-payer health system, you know, even though it's completely rational. And, and Ted Kennedy, you know, every single year, every single year, he would put in Senate Bill, Senate Bill 2, every single year he was there, of trying to establish a federally funded uh, system of educating young women and young men who wanted to be doctors to finance them with federal scholarships so they could go to school and get their medical degrees when they couldn't afford it otherwise. And in exchange for that, they would spend four years after they got their medical degree working in public clinics to provide medical assistance for everybody across the country. It was as simple as that. And then they get engaged in, in you know, a preventive care and uh, prenatal care and all the kind of things that they would do. And uh, he, he could never get it out of committee. You know, and he was one of the most powerful and influential men in the United States Senate. He couldn't get it out of committee ever. 
because the insurance companies are locked down against it. You know? And a second issue I might want to point out, just to be controversial, uh, is you know, that you've got to understand that the, the, the people who are primarily going to benefit from a single-payer health system funded by tax monies are black people and Hispanic people and minority people. And the rich 1% don't want them to live. Take that one home and study that, because that's the reality. That's always been the reality, is that that elite group of people believe that their country is being taken over by racial minorities, which could generate a very interesting conversation with Native American people. <laughs> you know? So, so but, but, but that's, that's the attitude that they've got, and they don't want their money taken away to save all of those people. You know, and that's uh, an unfortunate fact. Now, now, that's not necessarily placing them in the Republican Party or Democratic Party. You can do your own research on that. See where they are. Okay? So anyway, there's, uh, there's our discussion of Roe versus Wade. Uh, and uh, coming Tuesday, we will, we will have our discussion of, about uh, In Re Pappas, uh, which is the right of journalists to protect their confidential news sources. Really interesting case. And it'll open on to the Pentagon Papers case on Thursday for next week. Uh, and those are a couple hooters. And uh, we'll, have, we'll have some good fun with those. If you haven't signed in,